is um, number two in this semester's uh, lecture series on uh, contemporary China. And uh, we're very happy today to have uh, Professor Yu Zhou, who visits us from Vassar. She earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota in 1996 in geography. Uh, and before that, she was at Beijing University, where she got both her BA and MA degrees, also in geography, um, and teaches in earth sciences and geography at Vassar now. Her work uh, has included substantial research on um, what is often called China's Silicon Valley, the Zhongguancun area, uh, so working with uh, in globalization. Uh, but she's also done a fair amount on uh, environmental issues in China uh, and is currently part of the Loose, Loose Initiative on Asian Studies in the Environment. At Vassar is the lead of that project uh, and uh, has been spending most of her summers um, doing research on mm -hmm. that recently in, in Beijing and parts of China. Uh, and will speak to us today on green buildings in China. So please welcome Professor Yu Zhou. So it's a great honor to come here to give this talk as part of the Contemporary China series. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is reporting a research I've been doing the last few years to tracking the progress and development of China in the Green Building Initiative. So we all know Beijing has bad air quality. Actually, uh, I think that uh, no other city in the world have received so much press about the air quality as Beijing had. So uh, one particular bad episode, actually the worst, happened in January 2013, where various indexes of pollution have hit the roof. And particularly problematic or dangerous is that the level, the heavy level of pollution persisted for 25 out of 31 days of that month. So um, you could say this is the darkest month in recent memory, and uh, uh, Chinese urban residents, especially urban middle class, became very anxious, even panicking about what this is, uh, uh, how the air pollution is affecting their health. And you may ask, what does air pollution have anything to do with green buildings? Well, um, worst air pollution happens in January in the heating season, and most China still use coal for heating. So if you want to reduce air pollution, either you stop heating, you know, be frozen, but, or you have to increase the efficiency of the building. And many of you probably know uh, that in earlier this year, there was a, a documentary under the dome, financed and made by China's leading journalist, Chai Jing, which again captures national attention on the air pollution issue. So the documentary looking at the harmful effect of air pollution, the cause of it, what the government had been doing and what it failed to do, and also engage the public about what they can do about this uh, air pollution problems. So um, the video went viral, so in about two weeks time before it was took down by the Chinese government, um, it's gathered somewhat like 200 million viewers for a documentary that is 100 minutes long, you know, it's not your cat video went viral. So, um, and the reason it became viral because it's really hit the core for most Chinese uh, middle class um, that um, get them really um, concerned about the air quality problems. So, and so the public pressure is one, air, is one force that pushes China's Green Building Initiative. Another force is China's international pledge on climate change. China had made a series of international pledges in 2009, it's pledged by 2020, it's going to reduce the carbon intensity, which is the carbon emission per unit of GDP to 40, 50, or 55 level of 2005. This year it goes further to say, okay, by 2030, we would reduce the carbon intensity 60 to 65%. 
and also uh, China promised to hit the carbon peak in 2030 and 20% of energy should come from renewable sources. So how do you reduce your carbon intensity? You have to increase um, building efficiency. It's a big part of the effort. Um, so um, this chart is made by NRDC, which is a National Resource Defense Council. This is a US NGO. And uh, um, they look at China's energy and find like building itself costs about a quarter of China's total energy use. And then you have to add on top of it the um, the energy that is used to make the construction material. So then if you add them all together, uh, it is building energy consumption. I have the uh, Professor Li uh, who's uh, calculated about half of China's total energy consumed. is either of uh, building the building and <laughs> operating the building. And 60% uh, of carbon emission came from this source. And it's 60% because the heating and other uh, constructions using particularly high carbon content fuel. And um, so a green building project is a way to uh, trying to deal with that problems. Um, I'm just giving a, a very general definition of green building for those of you who are not particularly in that field. Um, so it's environmentally sustainable building, designed, constructed, operated to minimize the total environmental impact. There are five areas that Chinese own green building label trying to address. One is the site planning, what kind of land you use for construction. Water conservation, very important in northern China. Indoor air quality, well, um, something we obviously care if we live in there. And uh, land use, this has to do with how concentrated, what is the density of the construction. And energy use, perhaps one of the most uh, often used um, criteria, energy efficiency of buildings. So, um, and we obviously, everything, happen in China is important to the world and I would say you know that's true for green building as well for three obvious reasons. One is the size and the growth of Chinese buildings and uh, also the stage in which China is going through urbanization and also the third reason is the current consumption of building energy in China. So if we, this should be very familiar to most of you uh, uh, regarding China. China has been building enorm <coughs> enormous uh, floor spaces. As you can see, the rural construction declined because many people have migrated out of rural area, but urban, uh, since 1990s, urban construction had took off and lots of skyscrapers, this is in Chongqing. And so the World Bank estimated up until 2015, China, um, China built half of the world new buildings. So <coughs> that's every two buildings uh, that one uh, came up from China. So the equivalent to the rest of the world combined. And in terms of urbanization, this is from McKinsey that um, China is still in the process of rapid urbanization. So the, the study published in 2010, so they expect in the next 15 years to 2025, about 400 million Chinese population will move from rural to urban areas. Therefore, they need housing. And in terms of construction, that uh, the, the lower bottom of the chart, 40 billion square meter floor space needed. So that's the equivalent of building 10 New York. So every two and a half, every two years, the China just have to build another New York. And so that's a lot of construction. And uh, um, the third reason is that um, actually, if you measure of the building energy consumption at the current moment, China is actually among the lowest. And US and Canada is up there 
in terms of per capita use of energy. Canada is even worse than us. I think it's because it's colder there. And uh, uh, we know that European cities and European housing are constructed with energy efficiency in mind. But if you look at the OECD uh, consumption of energy, it's still several times of China. Uh, the reason that China's building energy consumption is low is not because Chinese buildings are wonderful. Uh, it's just simply because people, you know, uh, uh, wear their down coat at home. And uh, so the, much of China, South China, did not have, when, well, still do not have provisions of winter heating. So you're just being cold and wear your jackets all the time. And, but we accept, expect that will change. You know, as income rises, there'll be more and more heating provision at home. And in the summer, there'll be more use of air conditioning, right? So if your building are not designed well, um, the total energy use to do, uh, to heat and cool the building will be huge. So uh, even though China started with low, this is precisely why we need to worry about um, lack of building improvement. OK, so uh, NRDC also uh, tried to uh, calculate the potential for green buildings. So I'm only giving you two examples, which they look at two different scenarios. The moderate scenario, scenario is that if we reduce by 50%, five of the five percent of existing buildings and sixty percent of new buildings by 2015, and that would be equivalent to the, any of the following. Um, so, for example, in this corner one, remove all car from Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, halting air traffic globally for four months. And, and, and so on. And they also, you know, if you can dream your, dream your best dreams, is to say greening all Chinese building. Would it be equivalent to any of the followings? Remove all cars from UK, Spain, Italy, halting air traffic globally for three years. So, you know, that would never happen, but it, there's a lot of potential uh, for um, building better buildings. And building better buildings is actually also better for the clients that live in these buildings as well. Okay, so um, green building movement has emerged in the world since the 1970s, so it's not something new, but different countries have different approaches on green buildings. This is a high, uh, highly generalized term, so I would say in the United States it's a more a market approach that many of you probably heard about LEED, which is a label that created by um, the U.S. Green Building Congress. So, and uh, it is um, used as, um, in some ways, as a corporate label that if you want to show as a corporation you care about the environment and when you build a headquarters and you are in D centers you want to have a lead label so it's a sort of a public image right and and the lead buildings do save money in terms of operating cost so that's another incentive for the clients living in the buildings so i would say it's mostly market approach some Municipalities do subsidize lead, but it's not common. And Germany is the one that perhaps did the most in terms of green building promotions, where we have a very strong state and market relations, state business collaboration. So Germany has issued really uh, five different building codes since the 1970s and became more and more strict in terms of efficiency requirement. And German companies came up with really good technology. And one of the, my, uh, the label their passive house is one of the most ultra efficient uh, buildings. It's not as common in Germany, but it certainly pioneered a lot of uh, technology used in green buildings. And Singapore is another example where the state really take control of green building process. Um, building um, BCA, which is the uh, 
Singapore's building construction authority is part of the government and they oversee all buildings. So they set up target, okay, uh, we want 80% of our building green certified by 2030. So they're very powerful organizations and, uh, um, and have very aggressive target. Singapore also has done a lot of work to train their architect. So they're very professional, they all know uh, what green building technology is all about. So um, it's a very um, rapid, efficient top-down system. Now, um, I would like to have a wild guess. Which approach do you think China would take? Germany? Singapore. Singapore. Okay, so um, that should not be too much a surprise that China is taking the Singapore approach, this top down, right? So China started this green building effort really late uh, in 2005, and that's when they issued this first mandate for all the buildings to have some. Uh, energy efficiency requirement, which is equivalent to somewhat like Germans in the 90s. And, but at the same time, they say, okay, we should not just have this mandate, we should also uh, make an even higher level of requirement, which is a voluntary rating system that developed in the 2006, and the first certificate of green building issued 2008. So uh, this is a voluntary program. So after a few years, as China became increasingly aware that the importance of reduced um, emission, the state came back and said, oh God, this is too slow. You know, voluntary is not going to do it. So we're going to have even more uh, stronger measures. So in 2013, the January 1st, the number one state directive was on green buildings. So which again set up target just like Singapore did. So 20% of new building has to be green certified by 2030. All public building has to be green certified. And then each provinces are allowed to have um, their own incentives, the subsidies or whatever other program they can came up with. Um, so in a way, it looks like a Singapore's, but as all of us know, China is not Singapore. Uh, it is a much, much big country uh, with various um, place and characteristics. So um, one of the um, interesting questions I have regarding China's approach of green buildings, you know, the state action is good, but the question is, are they effective? Right, and so I ran into this article um, by uh, Jurgen Renders, who's the author of famous Limit to Growth, which he talked about. You know, these five solu solutions, such as high price on carbon, I assume the solution for climate change, have all been proposed and sadly rejected by democratic majority. As has the most obvious sixth solution, which is to reinstall enlightened dictatorship for a limited time period in critical policy areas like Romans did when the city was challenged, which is the solution currently pursued by Chinese Communist Party with obvious success in poverty, energy, climate area. But I agree that obvious solution of a strong government appears unrealistic in democratic West. So here he was, you know, talking about, you know, China did it right, you know, you really should have this top-down uh, systems to help environment and clim climate change agenda. And the question I have is that, is this enlightened state actually going to do the job? Um, I look at a, a number of literature, so, but I don't want to really bore you here, but just to, to look at one author, uh, Drezek, he's looking at the role of state in environmental uh, programs. So on the one hand, he suggests that administrative state has the benefit of a long-term vision and the distinctive claim to ecological rationality that rests on its purportedly embodiment of common purpose, 
neutral expertise, capacity to make sense of complex problem, and the will and authority to effect solution to these problems. So in the one hand, the state really occupy a unique place in terms of environmental action. But at the same time, he argues there's constraints and problems. One of the problems is to ensure compliance of your subordinates. The second problem has to do with environmental problems are complex, right? And so will the state bureaucracy generally functions on small fixed target? So how do you reconcile both? And then the lack of transparency when you install a top-down systems. So, um, and we know there's many people who are crit uh, prominent critics of state power. Uh, Landbaum argues that state have strong thumb, no fingers, you know, lack of flexibility. And James Scott, another prominent critic of state action, uh, elaborate that the intervention from above doesn't give sufficient allowance for real functioning social order and ignore practical knowledge, informal processes, and uh, um, <clears throat> improvisation in the face of unpredictability. And Ken Libosaw, who is a famous China specialist, studied China's bureaucracy as a fragmented authoritarianism. So the idea that the state may have a problem to ensure compliance. So what I really want to do is to look at the sector more closely. In some way, green building is more uh, friendly to state action compared to other environmental agenda because the government already play a key role in construction from land acquisition, from planning, building codes. So government is already there. And all you need is add another environmental layer. But this construction sector we know is also very difficult because they have many interest groups and these interest groups are powerful with vested interest. So um, just quickly what the I do. Uh, I track the development from 2011 to 14. So basically, I collected three sets of information. I did a lot of interviews. If you see these figures, green figures, where I did my interviews with government officials, property managers, developers, and uh, other related uh, journalists and scholars. And also, I compiled a database of China's green building stocks up to, um, I think, 20, the end of 2013. And I did a survey of China's major architect uh, institute and 121 architect about the experience of green buildings. So you see these buildings where I did my a survey. So um, I want to first tell you something about general profile of China's green building up to now. First of all, I think the state attention did work in the sense that we are seeing a rapid increase of green building project. So uh, you probably cannot see the color, but um, you see the right line on the left graph is going up very rapidly. These are the total green building project. The purple, li purple line lower than that is the Chinese standard of green building. The green line at the bottom is the LEED certified building. Actually, the LEED building is also going up very rapidly. But because LEED took very long to get certification, so they kind of stocked in a pipeline. And, but in terms of percentages, it's still very, very low. As you can see, in terms of the red line is the percentage of finished building stock is less than 2%. Even if we are looking at a rapid growing trend, it's still a very marginal um, number of buildings are certified green. So that's one high, high growth. Um, if we look at what criteria people use to apply what kind of buildings, we find this huge divergence in different standards. LEED is the red one that um, you can see offices and mixed building project, which is office commercial mixed. 
tends to be LEED certified and the Chinese standard of green building tends to apply for residential buildings. What this tells us is that LEED actually have morphed into a really this corporate luxurious symbol. You know, you have a lot of money and you want to build a LEED project to show that, you know, you're committed to the environment. Um, <coughs> And another thing as a geographer, what I pay attention to, and it's so obvious that you can't possibly not pay attention to it, which is that the green buildings are heavily, heavily concentrated in the most wealthy cities. And so the green areas are three um, you know, uh, economic hubs in China, Pro River Delta on the south, Yangji River Delta in the middle, and uh, um, Bohai Rim in the north. So uh, if I compile eight top cities of where they have largest green buildings, um, they're together is equivalent to all other rest of China combined. So 50% of the green building stocks in top eight cities, and these cities only 7% of China's population. So geographically, this is extremely top heavy and the question why that is the case. Um, I also compared green buildings uh, with their, um, in terms of sale prices and their management fee with the neighboring non-green or conventional building complex. So uh, what I did is you have a green building and so I took the average of three buildings nearby, look at their sale, sales price and the management fee. And so it turns out between 330 pairs. Green building is about 2,000 RMB more expensive, 20% more expensive. And uh, the management fee which um, some of you probably don't know, we probably don't pay it here as much. Uh, manage, management fee, a uh, property management fee is a good indicator about the status of your complex. The more expensive it is, the more high end. So uh, management fee is about a third more expensive in green building. So what this tells me is that uh, really the green building are built on the high end. You may say, well, maybe it's just more expensive to build, therefore they sell higher price. Well, um, the Chinese Ministry of Housing has calculated if you choose wisely, um, the, the additional cost, the per square meter is only, even the highest level of green building is only 88 yuan. But here we're looking at 2,000 yuan more. So, so what this tells me is that, you know, despite the fact that we're applying for Chinese residential kind of a label on Chinese green building label, we're still looking at a very luxurious bias toward, you know, green buildings. Um, mostly because these buildings pick high cost um, technology, you know, uh, the low E window, geothermal, solar power, and so on and add a lot of cost. And they often advertise by high comfort level. Uh, so much so that a Chinese planner asked me, why should China promote green buildings? Because after all, these buildings cost more energy. So it's sort of self-defeating. <coughs> and uh, also, if you think about it, if you're a buyer, the high property fee really is a problem because the, the incentive for green buildings is that you pay less in terms of operating cost. But now you have to pay more in terms of a property management fee. So that defeats the incentive. And because green building is seen as a luxurious uh, type of buildings that less uh, wealthy areas tend not to adopt it. I <clears throat> uh, just want to give you two concrete examples. Uh, these are buildings I um, visited in Nanchang, which is the uh, capital of Jiangxi province, in interior China. <clears throat> they are relatively similar in terms of uh, distance to downtown. Uh, on the left is a lead silver certified buildings, 
On the right is Chinese uh, green building uh, three stars. So they both are green buildings. But on the left, you can see a very luxurious interior. And there are some visible you know, solar panels. And they use copper wire, and which is supposed to be sustainable, but also happen to be very expensive. And uh, um, what is the most interesting is that the salesperson said that the biggest advantage of this building is that it con it maintain constant indoor temperature. So which means you need eight months of heating and cooling to achieve that. And remember, this is at a city where there's no collective provision for winter heating, right? Um, so clearly a very energy intensive building. And on the right, um, they did not promise constant indoor temperature, but they did say that they can uh, moderate extreme hot and cold in four months of the year. And in terms of prices, uh, Alpha, which on the left, is almost double the price of MoMA. This is built, uh, the three-star buildings. So uh, when I ask the salesperson of MoMA, oh, can you really make money? Because 7,500 is about similar as non-green building nearby. Oh, they said, oh, we cannot make any money on this, you know, but it's OK. We'll take a loss on this project because it's our first time to try this. And so if you're a developer, clearly Alpha would give you more money and uh, more pro better profit margin than MoMA does. So you can see, as a developer, the uh, making choice on more luxurious end is much more rewarding than if you, you do it the other way around. Um, I just uh, some pictures about a more prominent green building in China. These are public buildings. Uh, this is the first uh, silver uh, uh, plantum or gold, I don't remember exactly, building that uh, built by Steve Ho, American architect that he did a lot of uh, uh, major project in China that are, are um, LEED certified. And uh, um, I'm not an expert on architect, so um, can't exactly say how good I find this building complex. The only thing I would say, you know, I have very hard time to find the doors to get into any of these buildings. Okay, um, and uh, he also built uh, uh, headquarter for Wanke, which is the largest real estate company in China, in Shenzhen. So that's a, a lead plantum building, uh, the highest certified building. And you can see he used a lot of uh, shades um, um, uh, on the building to shelter from the sun, which is a good thing. But you also have to know that these shades are custom made, so they're super expensive. The building costs a billion dollars built. And there are some environmental features, such as you use bamboo as furniture. Bamboo is good in the um, sustainable world. And then the permeable surface in the courtyard. They have some solar tubes um, to save the indoor lighting. But again, you know, you're looking at a really, really expensive example. Um, here's another, this is a, a conventional complex I visited in Beijing. And they did not apply green building techniques except in the swimming pool in the front. And that's what they used the uh, uh, geothermal heating for the swimming pool. And here is their geothermal unit, which is completely imported from abroad, very expensive. And they said, well, it saved 10% of energy in the swimming pool operation. And you, there's not many, I counted less than a handful of people in the swimming pool. So um, in the meantime, oh, this is the un inside the unit. I don't know whether you have this kind of refrigerators uh, in your house, but I, I certainly do not. Um, and they do have really nice imported windows uh, for energy insulation. So in the meantime, we see a lot of these type of construction going up in Beijing um, with uh, you know, glassy, uh, glassy doors. And if you know, in, term, uh, uh, in, in terms of technology, glass 
uh, buildings are extremely bad for energy conservation because they, they're really easy to get really hot in the sun and they're really hard to insulate. Um, but it appeared to be one of the popular methods of building. <clears throat> so um, to try to understand why this is the case, uh, I look at four stakeholders that um, what their role in terms of green building promotion or not promotion. So first I look at the, the government. Uh, if I could actually explain this, I'll be successful in this lecture. So um, the role of state. Um, here we use the term Chinese often say tiao tiao and kuai kuai. Um, tiao tiao means hierarchical state relations. Kuai kuai means horizontal relations. So um, at the national level, which is the top level, the Chinese government is very committed to reduce carbon intensity and to promote green buildings. And uh, the uh, organization mostly responsible for it is the MOHAD, which is the Ministry of Housing, Urban, and Rural Development. But MOHAD could not get a national program all off the ground unless this program is approved by Minis uh, Ministry of Land and Resources, which is MOLR. And <clears throat> MOLR and the Mohawk couldn't get it to work unless the Ministry of Finance agreed that to provide the money. So um, it took quite a few years to get them agreed, and they would not have agreed had it not been the National uh, Development Research Council in Chinese Far Gai Wei forced them to. So that one has to be on board. So at the national level, you're looking at sort of coordination of these major bureaucratic entities. And all of these entities then are replicated uh, in, at the provincial level. So uh, you have Bureau of Construction, you have Planning Commission, Bureau of Land, and you have NDRC, which is the provincial branch of national NDRC. Again, at this level, remember the national government said, OK, so each province should get their own programs. I really want to encourage you to be innovative, figure out a best way to encourage a green building. But at the provincial level, they really have a hard time to get their other people on board. So what they did is to say, OK, so the national government want us to do this. Um, all the public building would have to be green certified. So that one we cannot go without. So we just have to say uh, this is our province plan. But in terms of giving any incentives, some innovative ideas, and they got stuck. You know, because that means they have to coordinate with all other entities, which may or may not have the national mandate. And what is in there for, say, planning commission to work with Bureau of Construction? There re isn't really a lot to, um, a lot of reason to do that. So you run into very quickly sort of a turf of each organizations to coordinate them became very difficult. So even though there is a national action plan, when you talk to the provinces, I think you know, China has 31 provinces or uh, national level cities or autonomous region. Only six, the wealthiest, came up with the idea, OK, we can subsidize green buildings. And there's also another four said, well, you know, uh, maybe if they build a green building, we can give them some award. We have no money. Uh, we could say the developer could build a higher um, floor to land ratio, which then means the developer could have more unit to sell uh, uh, per building. So, so maybe we could do that. The rest of the provinces basically sitting on their hand saying, well, you know, we don't know what to do because you know, we can't really get other people agree with us and, and, and so on. So uh, at the provincial level, you already have this sort of a watered down effect that the people don't quite know what to do uh, or didn't want to do anything particularly uh, disrupting. 
uh, the political order of the time. And but that's an intermediate level. Really, what matters at is at a municipality level, which mayor is the most powerful player in either proving or disproving which project to go on. So I was just putting some of these projects um, at the circle. So for the mayor, really the overwhelming incentive is to get project built. Um, some of you are familiar with that the Chinese promotion system is often um, hinged upon GDP growth. Some political scientists say no, you know, Chinese official get promoted. GDP is only one indicator, one of the criteria for them to get promoted. They're right that there are many criteria that in which Chinese officials are judged. Except almost all of these criteria have to do with the fact you need to get a project built. So they are rewarded for GDP growth. They are also rewarded for higher government income, which tax, so which comes from more project. They are rewarded for land lease fee, which is the major part of local budget, which depends on whether you can get a project built. They are rewarded for trade statistic, financial statistics, which also depends on whether you got a project built or not. Right, so at this level, that the incentives are getting project built, overshadowing anything else. And some of these projects, for example, Project 3, require permissions from all of the organization at the provincial level and may require at the national level because it's a large project. Others require different level approval, and mayor may also have project, his pet project, which doesn't re really require much other people's approval. So at this level, mayors have every reason to work really hard to get a project built. And when the Chinese government say, you know, you can't build a conventional project, they say, okay, you know, let's, we'll build an eco city, we'll build green buildings. So, um, when the eco city, uh, when the state say, okay, we want to promote the eco city, all of a sudden, 200 municipalities said, we're going to build an eco city. Okay, so every, you know, for the incentives at the municipality level, that they really wanted to use big green buildings as excuse to build a new area. And in particular, it's the new district development because this developed land and from agriculture to urban, therefore the land lease fee could be a huge part of income for the municipality. So this is Guangzhou. Um, on the left you see Nansha, which is a new district about an hour from Guangzhou, that you pass through sort of banana uh, plantations, and then all of a sudden you see this new city rising up. This is a, a brick green building project built by Wan Ke, and it's really beautiful. It has recycles and everything else, except it didn't have enough people, or hardly anybody in it. And uh, so, but if you go say, okay, these houses are not uh, being sold. No, they are all being sold. All the houses in Nansha has been sold, except they're sold to um, as second homes or third homes for urban residents in Guangzhou. And these people uh, have no reason actually to move here. They, they're, they bought these apartments because the, the housing price issue which we're going to talk about later. So it's actually, you know, when the city wanted to have some um, a waste water processing in this new district, what they find is that they couldn't generate enough waste water because there aren't enough people living in it to, to generate the waste. So, uh, <laughs> And, and so, and again, for those of you watching China, you know these urban districts are pretty common all over the place. It's not just Guangdong. This is Nanchang's new Pudong district that newly developed the financial district. Um, and the sur nearby, they're also trying to build another complex, which is sort of have the image of European cities in Nanchang, and it was already built in some way, and not 
uh, even further away from this new district is you know, another part that was opened up for building the new provincial center. Um, my, uh, this, you know, one of the, if you remember the, the Luxuria project that located here, um, the government supported because it would have a high sales price, that means the land fee is higher. So, um, and of course, part of the reason has to do with the market dynamics in China. Uh, the real estate market has took off, particularly after 2008, when the Chinese government pumped in a lot of money to stimulate, uh, to counter the financial aid, a uh, financial crisis in 2008. So a lot of money comes in, which end up somehow find their way in the real estate market. So the price has going up very rapidly until this year. So you could see why the uh, middle class Chinese want to buy more homes, additional houses, and why the uh, cities wanted to build a new district. Now, um, the problem obviously is that it's created disincentive for green buildings, why? Um, because for the government level, I already said that eco city and green building are seen as sort of excuse to have new development. And for developers, when the housing prices goes up so rapidly, it, the most important thing for you is to get things being built and sold very quickly, right? You don't want to delay which green building you really do. You think about careful design, you think about adjustment to the local ecological conditions which takes time and then in the speculative context you don't have time and even for building professionals many of them are architect design designers and they have like a dozen projects in their hand that they all need to be built very quickly and so you know you end up being you know mass producing buildings rather than sort of really thinking carefully about a sustainable design. And for people who buy these apartments, right, if you think about it as invested investment, not some place you live, you don't really care how much energy it's, called, it's used to operating. Um, so all of them create a potential disincentive for uh, green buildings. And so that's government and market, uh, I have a few minutes, um, that the third um, stakeholder is professional, pro building professionals, um, which they are, the good news is they are very interested in green building. The bad news is they don't have time for it, and also they do not have the uh, professional training and the network that are critical for green buildings. So uh, you cannot see, but basically the first left is the barrier for green buildings. And among them, they identify lack of expertise, um, lack of technology understanding. These are architects said themselves, you know, we don't have expertise. So um, they're pretty frank about what is, uh, you know, they're lacking. And also in the source of information, we see the government is the main source for information. But if we look at the informal exchanges, mass media, foreign exchanges, conferences, we find that they are not a very important information source for green building. In particular, um, Mass media, uh, the fourth one on, from the left, actually are seen as one of the key, most important media uh, information source, more than professional sources. So basically that means architects get more, heard more about green building <coughs> from mass media than they are from professional media. So what basically says is that there's a lack of information exchange at a professional level on green buildings. 
And uh, just very quickly, green building actually requires a lot of professional networking because it's an integrated technology, heating, electric, water, landscape, construction material, all of these need to work together, building design, maintenance, and uh, management also have to work together. Without a professional network, it is difficult to get green building built. It is not a one technology uh, sort of a solution. It's a it's an integration of several different technology. So, and that has been uh, also a problem. Um, this one gave you the summary of the survey. So it's a little complex, but I would just want to you see at the bottom line. So survey about sixty three. Um, uh, architecture Institute, only half of them have built any green buildings, and only 33% of the architect had experience in green buildings. So we're looking still at a very underdeveloped professional training in this area. And But you notice, interestingly, on the top that all the, uh, it's 100%, it's Guangzhou, uh, which all the architect institute have done green buildings, and all the architect in these uh, also have done green buildings. So I wonder what happened in Guangzhou. They all have a lot of experience on this. So, um, oh, that's one more thing before I answer that question. The last uh, stakeholder is public. Uh, what I find is that the public almost have no uh, information and understanding of green building. If you say green building, they think, oh, there must be building with a lot of trees. And, uh, um, and not only the public, also the salesperson, if you go to buy these apartment, even the salesperson did not mention the building has green label. And there's also this sort of disconnect. You would think that um, maybe Chinese consumers don't care about green buildings. But if you talk to them, the buyers actually are very aware about several things they want with their buildings. They want their building space, and they want the building to have the right orientation toward the sun um, so that it's naturally warm and cool. They want good ventilation, natural ventilation. Some people talk about feng shui, which is important. And the indoor air quality is important. But there is no effort from the government level to really uh, incorporating these <coughs> consumer preference into green building la label. So there's really no awareness in the public about the green buildings. And that's, it's puzzling because this uh, pro program has been in place since 2006. So um, the lastly, I want to give you some sort of good news. There are some good examples of Chinese instit research institute that um, uh, using the right approach to promote green buildings. For example, Shenzhen Building Research Institute, uh, it is their building and it's very green and uh, it's have certain design features. When they designed the building, they made a competition and also they constantly engage with the public about the performance of the building. If you go there, they're open to public all the time. Your mother bring their kids, sort of play into the building. Their tours constantly. So uh, this is their uh, conference room with open air and uh, plants to cool it down. And uh, uh, the indoor, um, I mean, it's actually pretty uh, acceptable lighting, but my camera doesn't really catch it. So. Um, as a result of their very sort of engaged public work that you have in Guangzhou, almost all the uh, architecture are familiar with green buildings. So it does make a difference what you do with your approach. Most other building institutes see themselves only as a research arm of the government, have no mandate to engage the public. Well, Shenzhen uh, Building Institute think otherwise. 
So um, there's another area I find interesting collaborations between Chinese state and businesses on energy and buildings, which is the, uh, the growth of energy service corporation. These are the small private corporations that they basically are consultants for um, organizations. So they come in auditing your building energy profile and give, provide a solution, sometimes finance the solution for reduce the building's um, energy consumption. And there has been very, very rapid growth of ESAO. In 2005, only a couple was established by World Bank. And in 2010, we're looking at hundreds and now thousands of these uh, private consulting firms that has emerged that work closely with the government. Um, and increasingly, they became more sophisticated. At first, it was like, oh, change your light bulbs. And now they have more sophisticated solution. So my point is that there are things one could do. Um, there are collaborations that can work in leveraging the state power and mandate to have a better uh, result. So um, I guess just summarize what I see as strengths and weaknesses of China's green building programs. The strength is that, well, you know, it did get something started. Uh, so rapid growth and national level attention, Chinese state are good at doing that. And new technology in green building has also emerged as a response for private companies. But um, there's really prominent weaknesses in terms of its luxurious bias, its geographical concentration, and uh, it, the new district development, and the various disincentives for private sector to engage in the green buildings, and perhaps more profoundly, lack of participation of public and professionals. And so I guess my, I would conclude to say that in terms of green building development, I think the lesson from China is that you really need two major transformations for this to work. Uh, you have to move from a sort of a command and control uh, mentality into uh, actions that collaborate with, with and leverage other stockholders to be engaged in the green building programs. And this means that it has to move beyond the closed bureaucratic circle in involving the public uh, to, uh, to participate in the movement. Otherwise, you're kind of spinning your circle, um, really not doing too much besides like two, three percent. So um, I guess I would say that um, technocratic approach is insufficient without more participatory urban governance and open discourse on green buildings. So again, we go into the question of governance that just having enlightened dictatorship is not sufficient. And so uh, called by Pollock that environmentalism cannot be successful in the long run without a continuous enhancement of opportunities for democratic participation. Okay, so I'm done with my lecture and see whether you have any questions. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> Thank you.